Therefore, it is now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, uh, uh, Speaker. In the uh, last week, there have been three high-profile incidents of Ontarians stuck abroad because of the lack of hospital beds at home. Mm -hmm. Oh, the question is to the Premier. Thank you. One of those men, Stuart Klein from London, passed away this past weekend at a hospital in St. Catharines. He was stuck in Mexico and then in St. Catharines, some 200 kilometres away from his home. This tragedy is a direct result of this government's refusal to properly fund hospitals across the province. It's a tragedy, Speaker, that should not, must not happen again to an Ontario family. Mr. Speaker, how is this government preventing a similar tragedy from happening again? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I completely agree with the uh, member opposite that this is a tragedy, that this is a situation that uh, should not have arisen, Mr. Speaker, when, uh, um, when Ontarians travel abroad, they, uh, they uh, take the safe decision, I hope, to, uh, to purchase travel insurance, and they expect that that will allow them to get the care that they, uh, that they need, Mr. Speaker. That is our expectation as well, that the insurance company and the health system would work together, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. And I think that we need collectively, we need to ask very serious questions about what happened here. And for me, Mr. Speaker, what is, what is uh, particularly concerning is that um, as of February 26, there were 31 level 2 and 3 ICU beds available in Toronto, there were 34 available in Hamilton, Niagara, there were 16 available in the Southwest, Answer. and there were seven available in Erie, Mr. Speaker. So we have very serious questions to ask about what was that communication between the insurance company and the system. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the Premier. The CBC reported that his eldest son was left asking many questions. Quote, the, kind, the question that kind of haunts me, could it have been different if he had come back right away? Do we need question? Do we need to go through all that additional torment of just waiting? Quote, having him sedated for so long, did that adversely affect his condition? We'll just never know those answers. Quote. And he's right, Speaker, we'll never know those answers. But what we do need to know now is that no other family will be left asking these same questions. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier promise families that they won't be stuck in a foreign country waiting for a hospital bed? <laughs> As I said, this is a very, uh, this is a very serious question. Um, there are, as as the uh, as the member opposite has said, there are uh, many questions swirling around this. Um, we know, Mr. Speaker, that the hospital had ongoing communication with the insurer to recommend locations where the patient could receive appropriate care in order to get them uh, home safely, Mr. Speaker. Um, what we know is that there were beds available in Toronto, in Hamilton, Niagara, in the southwest. And in Erie. So, Mr. Speaker, the question is, what was the disconnect in that conversation between the insurer and the health system, Mr. Speaker? The beds were available. The system was working in the sense that the beds were there. There were vacancies. They were available. So why did that happen? I don't have the answer, Mr. Speaker. And the, uh, the member opposite rightly asked the Can question. We are asking those questions, Mr. Speaker, because answer. I agree it should not happen again. Thank you. Final supplementary, the member from Melbourne, Minnesota, London. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Speaker, this government has failed the families of all Ontarians yep. who have been stuck abroad. They deserve to come home, and they deserve the treatment from Ontario's world-class doctors. Yep. But because of that government across the way, hospitals are over capacity and overcrowded. Hallways, bathrooms and closets, makeshift hospital rooms. It's unacceptable, and it's unacceptable in Ontario. It's unacceptable, period. Ontario can and must do better. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier pick up the phone and call the Klein family and apologize for their failure in the health care system? And will the Liberal government guarantee no other Ontario will be stuck in a foreign country because of the government's failure to fund our health care system? Well, Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, as I said, this is a tragedy, and I understand. I understand why the uh, the members opposite choose to politicize it. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, there were beds available in Ontario. There was capacity in the system, Mr. Speaker. If there hadn't been, then this would be a very different discussion. But there were beds, Mr. Speaker. There were 31 beds in Toronto, 34 beds in Hamilton, Niagara, 16 beds in the southwest, and seven beds in Erie. The question is, and it is a very serious question, Mr. Speaker, and I absolutely understand why the Klein family would be asking this question. Why was there not a better communication between the insurer and the system? What broke down that didn't allow their loved one to be here to get to Ontario, where there were beds available, Mr. Speaker? We are asking those questions, and Mr. Speaker, we will do everything in our power to make sure that this never happens again. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The headlines read, Ontario is courting a home care fiasco. There is no doubt, Speaker, that those headlines are right. Providers don't want this new SEIU agency. Workers don't want the new agency. Patients don't want the new agency. The only people that want the new agency are the Liberals and the SEIU. This does not pass a smell test. Mr. Speaker, what deal have the Liberals struck in return for creating this SEIU-backed agency? Mr. Speaker, um, you know, my, uh, my mom is 89 and my dad's going to be 92 in a few days. And I know that for them, having, having familiar people around is really important, Mr. Speaker. Having people who know them and who they don't have to make an adjustment. And, Mr. Speaker, when they do have to make adjustments, it's a real challenge for them and for my sisters and me. So I believe, Mr. Speaker, that. Everyone in Ontario who needs the support of a personal support worker um, should have the option to have more control and choice over their home care services, Mr. Speaker. That's what this is about. This is about helping people to get continuity in their care, giving them some choices. It's also about, and this may not be something that the member opposite cares Answer. a lot about, but it's also about support for personal support workers so that they can have a rational schedule and to do their work, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Thank you. Back to the Premier. Whenever and wherever an SEIU-backed home care agency pops up, Trouble soon follows. Washington State, Michigan, and other states are currently in lawsuits, just like here in Ontario, against the SEIU and their SEIU-backed agencies. Some of these lawsuits include improper disclosure of political contributions, wow. driving up the costs of home care, abuse of personal support workers, family caregivers, and patients. It's best summed up as an agency that will cause distress confusion and anxiety. The evidence is all here. Mr. Speaker, is the Liberal relationship with the SEIU really worth the distress, confusion and anxiety for patients, PSWs Question. and providers? Thank you. So again, Mr. Speaker, let me just say that um, you know we uh, we value the enormous contribution that personal support workers, Order. no matter what union they belong to, Mr. Speaker, no matter. Right after I ask for order, a certain member just keeps right on going, and uh, I'll be watching. Along with somebody making a comment, while well, I'm making a comment, and you can look away all you want, Minister. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, we value the work that personal support workers do, which is exactly why we have invested in personal support workers, Mr. Speaker. We have increased their, we've increased their salaries. And it the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, and the member from Leeds, Grenville will come to order. We're inching towards, thanks to those, to warnings. It doesn't matter what organization they belong to. The fact is, Answer. we have supported personal support workers across the board. This change is about providing patients with access to continuity and choice in their care, Mr. Speaker, which is, I think, Thank something you. we can all agree is important. Supplementary. Premier, it's important, Speaker, that this question is asked directly to the Premier. This agency was created with one bullet point 
in a news release. No further details on October 26, 2017, much to the delight of the SEIU. Around that same time, an SEIU-funded third party started running negative campaign ads against the PC party. So, Speaker, these questions need to be asked. Was the first set of attack ads funded by SEIU a thank you for creating this agency? And, Speaker, will there be a second set of ads if the Liberals continue down this path? It's true. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, if this is a question about negative publicity that the PC party is getting, I really can't wade into that, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. That really isn't that really isn't my bailiwick. But, Mr. Speaker, let me just say that the self-directed care model that we are looking at, Mr. Speaker, this is about giving patients more control over their care and more choice. And let me just read from uh, Bob. Hay the member from the PN Carleton will come to order. One more comment. We're going into warnings. Carry on. Let me just uh, quote from Bob Hepburn in the Toronto Star, Mr. Speaker, November 8th. The move is a welcome and long overdue initiative. It will address deep concerns by home care patients who have no control over hiring or scheduling of personal support workers. So, Mr. Speaker, the reality is that that reflects why we are making this Answer. move to give patients more control, more continuity in their care, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question? The member from London Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Larry Dan is a London man, a constituent of mine, who had to wait abroad for an Ontario hospital bed when he got sick. Larry recently spent eight days waiting in a Miami hospital. Minister of Municipal Affairs will come to order. We're now in warnings. We are in warnings. Finish, please. Larry recently spent eight days waiting in a Miami hospital ICU with a serious infection. His insurance company was told there were no beds for him at home. Can the Premier please explain to families in London and across Ontario why this keeps happening? Yep. Premier. Thank you very much. And I, you know what? I thank the uh, the member opposite for the question, as I uh, as I did when the um, member from the Conservative Party asked the question, Mr. Speaker. This is. This is a very important issue, Mr. Speaker. When there is capacity in Ontario uh, that, that patients wouldn't be able to get to those beds, Mr. Speaker, we have to ask why that would happen. Uh, and the, uh, the member opposite is talking about a, uh, a different situation than the one that we were discussing earlier. But, Mr. Speaker, um, I would hazard a guess that uh, even in that situation, and I don't know specifically, but if we looked across the whole province, there likely were beds that were available, perhaps not in a specific jurisdiction, but that should not be the issue, Mr. Speaker. If the beds are available in the province, if someone is overseas or is abroad, they should be able to come back to Ontario. Answer. That's the question that we're asking, Mr. Speaker. What's the breakdown between the insurers and the uh, system? And We need to get to the bottom of it, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, Larry never got an Ontario hospital bed. He was treated entirely in Miami. Luckily, he had travel insurance because we all know how much medical care can cost in the U.S. Larry said his insurance company was very diligent. They tried very hard to find him a bed to come home, even organizing an air ambulance to get him back to Ontario. But he was never moved because there weren't any beds. Does the Premier think that Larry's insurance company is lying to him. I think the member of the third party knows that I am not going to comment on a specific situation because I don't have the details, Mr. Speaker. And if indeed there were no beds anywhere in the province, then that is that is of great concern, Mr. Speaker. But if as in the previous situation, Mr. Speaker, there were beds in the province. They were available, not in the particular home community of the uh, patient, but there were beds available in the province. That's the situation that we need to unearth, Mr. Speaker. We need to understand if that's the case. And if that is the case, then why was that patient not be able to go to one of those beds? I don't know the answer to that in this situation, but those are the questions that we are in the process of asking, Mr. Speaker, because there is a disconnect between the uh, the insurer and the system, and we need to find out 
what Answer. what the problem is. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, Danny Marchand was in Collingwood. There was no insurer at that point, and he still couldn't get a bed in Ontario when he broke his leg in Collingwood. Larry Dan is one of too many cases where an Ontarian has been stuck abroad waiting for a hospital bed to open up at home. These families have been let down by the Premier and this Liberal government, which has cut and frozen hospital budgets for 15 years. They've been let down by the last Conservative government, which closed 28 hospitals and laid off 6,000 nurses fired 6,000 nurses. Ontario's hospitals are overcrowded. When will the Premier finally take action to fix this crisis, and when will she stop turning her back on these families? Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, um, it's it's quite the opposite. We have uh, we have made enormous investments in health care and in home care. We will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. We know that the health care system in Ontario and, quite frankly, in this country, is the is the greatest and clearest expression of our compassion for one another and of a fair society. So we, we completely understand that, which is why we continue to increase investment in the health care system across the board, Mr. Speaker. This is a very particular issue that we need to get to the bottom of, Mr. Speaker. There seem to be uh, some situations where there's been a lack of understanding or confusion between what the insurer is saying, what the health care system is saying. We need to get to the bottom of it, Mr. Speaker, and ensure that it doesn't happen again. Thank you. New question. The member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is also to the Premier. Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, better known as CHEO, is an incredible facility. Their health care providers care for six children from across Ontario, Canada, and even abroad. In February, CHEO Emergency Department had its busiest month on record. Every day, the hospital cared for 249 sick children in their ER, and one day, the frontline professional cared for 303 sick children. This winter, Toronto Sick Kids Hospital also had the busiest month they have ever had. Why is the Premier standing by and watching as the only two hospitals in Ontario that specializes in caring for sick children struggle every day with dangerously high overcrowding? Well, Mr. Speaker, we are <clears throat> we are not standing by and watching. We are actively engaged with our uh, hospitals across the province, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, um, <clears throat> just a few weeks ago, I sat down with uh, a group of hospital CEOs. I am listening to their concerns, and I recognize, Mr. Speaker, that on top of the uh, the hundred million dollars that we've invested to create 1,200 new hospital beds across the province, which is the equivalent of uh, six new medium-sized hospitals, Mr. Speaker. On top of the $500 million that we put in our uh, last budget, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that there is more to be done, and we are working with our hospital partners to make sure that we understand that and we continue to increase investments. Thank you, Supplementary. So far this year, CHEO has been forced to transfer 12 children, including four babies, to other hospitals because of the serious overcrowding crisis that they're trying to deal with. These kids are some of the most critically ill in their hospital. CHEO chief of staff said that it is often the sickest kids who are forced to move because of the overcrowding in their hospital. Why is the Premier okay with some of the sickest kids and babies in Ontario being forced to move away from home to get the treatment that they need? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I know that the government house leader wants to comment on this in the final supplementary, but um, let me just say that there, there is likely no more stressful time in a family's life than when a baby is sick. And uh, my heart goes out to anyone in the province who is, uh, who is going through that experience of, of trying to find the care, the right care for a sick child. And we are blessed in this province, Mr. Speaker, that we have hospitals like Sick Kids yeah. and CHEO that provide such excellent care and work with families to make sure that, uh, that their children get that care, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that there is more that we have to do. We recognize that there is, <clears throat> on top of the increases in funding that we have already made, Mr. Speaker, there's more that we need to do. 
and I recognize, Mr. Speaker, that as we uh, as we move forward, we need to continue Answer. to work with our partners to make sure that we solve the problems that they are uh, that they are actually confronting. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Dr. Gina Netto, she is the chief of emergency medicine, said, and I quote: "We're at peak season staffing, but despite that, we are overwhelmed." And I get the sense that we're not the only hospital that is overwhelmed. She's right, Speaker. Last week, Queensway Carlton Hospital declared a code orange, an alert issue when all hospital beds are full and every surge capacity has been exhausted. That was the second code orange in the hospital history. The first one was the month before. Is this what we've come to, Speaker? Ottawa Hospital deserve better than this. Families across Ontario deserve better than this. Why doesn't the Premier agree? Thank you very much, Speaker. I, and I, I want to uh, speak a little bit about Chio because I know that hospital very well, coming from Ottawa and being a father of two very young children. Uh, Chio is one of the most incredible children's hospital that we've got, uh, not only in Ontario, but, Speaker, I will say around the country and, and the world. And the staff at Chio works very hard every single day to ensure that our children in Ottawa area and beyond get the best care possible. Uh, speaker, the issue around overcrowding is a serious issue. Uh, and in fact, the chief of staff of CHIO herself said that the, the reason for the unexpected high number and the shortage of beds is because of the extraordinary flu season that we're seeing right now uh, taking place here in our province, as well as unusually large number of complicated medical cases. Speaker, the member opposite is right. This is a situation that is happening not only in Ontario, but across the country Answer. right now, where uh, beds are, are, are uh, there's overcrowding as a result of the flu season we're going through. That's happening in the United States as well, and we were dealing with that circumstance. No question. The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, staff at the only clinic providing life-saving PET CT scans in Windsor-Essex were shocked to learn their funding was to be completely cut off for their program. The clinic, which has been in operation for over seven years, was notified just hours before the government publicly announced a new PET CT scanner would not be going to their clinic. Head of the clinic, Dr. Kevin Tracy, says, I feel like I've been mugged. This is another example of this government giving with one hand while taking with another. My question to the Premier, why didn't the ministry properly notify this important community clinic of their funding was about to be cut off? Yeah, yeah. Thank, you, uh, uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we are very much committed uh, to an equitable access to quality care in all regions of Ontario. We'll continue to work with our health care partners to help patients get diagnosed faster. Speaker, we are adding new state-of-the-art medical imaging equipment including PET and CT uh, scanners where they can best serve patients. We're working with Cancer Care Ontario to ensure that existing uh, PET and CT scanners continue to provide high quality diagnostic imaging services for all Ontarians by planning their replacement in a timely manner and by prioritizing additional equipment uh, in new locations. Uh, Cancer Care Ontario speaker is currently working on a long-term strategy with an approach that considers several factors such as service needs, patient referral patterns, age of machine, downtime and facility capacity. Today, Answer. Ontario's provincial PET program has 14 PET and CT scanners in 12 centres across the province. Thank you. Supplementary. Right. Thanks, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Uh, speaker, for years, Dr. Kevin Tracy put countless hours, effort and his own money into a program that the government just brushed aside without notice. Shameful. He petitioned this government for a new scanner Shameful. and was led to believe the clinic would be receiving the new PET CT scanner. Instead, this clinic is now facing staff layoffs. My question for the Premier, can she explain why the government would go ahead with the decision without any consultation or discussion with Dr. Tracy's clinic? And will the Premier answer that question? Good question. Here, here. I want uh, speaker, to, uh, to, as, as I was speaking earlier of the long-term strategy that the, the Cancer Care Ontario is working on with our government, Speaker, uh, to launch this long-term strategy, we are providing Windsor Regional Hospital with a new PET CT scanner to help open a new site for scanning services in the Erie St. Clair region. Responding, Speaker, to the growing needs of the community, up to 600 patients per year will benefit from this new PET scanner. 
Increasing access to diagnostic services is part a speaker, of our plan to create fairness and opportunity during this period of rapid economic change. Speaker, the decision to help Windsor Regional Hospital open a PET CT scanning site is to reduce the likelihood of patients experiencing a service disruption from an existing aging scanner. This scanner, Speaker, is the only one serving patients in the entire Erie St. Clair region. Speaker, we will continue to make this very important Sir. investment. We work along with the local community to make sure that these services are uh, well targeted uh, for those communities Thank that you. will benefit the most. Thank you. Question. The member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Last week, I saw a very disturbing story about the death of suicide, by suicide of 15-year-old Kanina Sue Turtle in a foster home in Sioux Lookout. A video taken by her recording her own death wasn't seen by her parents until they received her belongings, including her iPod, many months later. The video shows Kanina was left alone in a back room of a home for 45 minutes before anyone came to check on her. By then, it was too late. The video shows. Oh, sorry. Um, hmm. Speaker, things like this shouldn't be happening. We shouldn't be having to ask these questions in the House, so I apologize. But I ask the minister how could such a tragic death happen, and what will be done to make sure that Question. it won't happen again? Thank you. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, you know, I agree with the member opposite. Um, these types of things should not happen in Ontario. And, um, you know, any any time a young person uh, takes their lives or hurts themselves, you know, I think everyone in this legislature, um, you know, feels for uh, that family and that community, and of course the individual. Um, so, as a minister uh, responsible to, for this file, um, you know we look for ways to uh, to work with uh, Indigenous partners. I've uh, gone across the province and spoken to communities. I've met with parents who have lost uh, loved ones, and um, you know we've uh, put in place some different strategies to look for ways to uh, uh, to help communities uh, with uh, these challenges. And in the supplemental, I'll talk about some of those initiatives that we're working on. Thank you. Supplement. Kanina's family has been trying to find out what happened to her. Her mother was told by the agency that her daughter was suicidal, something that she didn't believe until she actually seen the video. But she did have multiple scars from self-harming. Another video on Kanina's iPod showed that she tried to kill herself the day before in the bush. She was a very troubled youth, but she was left alone, and she took her own life. Since then, her parents have been left in the dark as they try to get the truth. Will the minister tell this family what happened to their daughter, and will he, will he put in place measures to ensure that this doesn't happen again? Thank you. Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, of course, any family that wants to connect with the ministry and, uh, and with me to talk about um, you know, any issue in regards to their children, I'm always available for those families. Um, you know, as a as a minister uh, uh, for this file, you know, I I always find uh, this particular um, you know area very challenging uh, for me emotionally because we're talking about children, we're talking about loss of of young people here in the province. You know, we've been working with Indigenous communities through our our strategy, our uh, Indigenous Children and Youth Strategy, to look for ways to uh, to build uh, more culturally appropriate programming for young people. You know, I've heard from leaders in the province that. You know, if you can build a resilience uh, within a child as a young person, as they get older, they take on some of the. Uh, it helps them take on some of the challenges. Land-based programming that we've uh, expanded here in the province as, as well. Answer. Um, but I think the real key here, Mr. Speaker, is to make sure that we work with communities and listen to communities and have communities' response to those issues right in their in their in their communities, rather than uh, going to other parts in the province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from Etobicoke North. Minister of uh, Economic Development. America. There is a tide of protectionism, tariffs, unfree trade, and Depression-era populism. They've introduced, as you will know, a proposed tariff on steel and aluminum globally, part of the growing uh, sentiment that we first saw with Buy American legislation in New York and Texas. Ontario Speaker is the Canadian leader of steel production. 20,000 people employed directly, 55,000 indirectly, especially concerning for communities like Sault Ste. Marie and Hamilton. 
The interim position of the interim PC leader tells me that they are rudderless, leaderless and aimless, likely busy with their own internal civil war. Speaker, the opposition parties have repeatedly made it clear that they have no in I, I'm standing to try to respond. The member will focus on government policy. Here, I find it troubling that our colleagues across the way have ostrich policies, head in the sand, and do not wish to stand up for businesses, workers, and families, particularly in Hamp. The minister is not helpful. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. I happen to know what I'm doing. If the member continues on that path, he'll lose his question. Ask a government policy. My question for the government minister is this. Will the Minister of Economic Development, Growth and Trade please explain to us Answer. why our policies regarding Bill 194 are so important? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I thank the member, of course, from Etobicoke North for his very pertinent question relating to government policy, specifically Bill 194. Speaker, last week in this legislature, we witnessed the very sad and sorry spectacle of members from the Conservative Opposition Caucus repeatedly standing up and on Bill 194, government policy, Speaker, repeatedly refusing to stand up for Ontario workers and businesses. It was sad, it was sorry, and, Speaker, it fundamentally stands in opposition to the core responsibility that every member of this legislature has. A member from Huron, Bruce, is one. Finish, please. It stands in stark contrast to what the people of this province expect of their elected officials. A member from Niagara West Glanbrook is warned. Just put your hand up if you want a warning, and then we'll move right to naming. You may finish, please. They can interrupt, Speaker, but they will never distract this That's government right. for standing up for the people of Ontario. We will support Bill 194. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Speaker, on this side of the chamber, we are, of course, very concerned about the Buy American trend, the hard right economic nationalism, policies that Trump's own defense, Treasury, and chief economic advisor oppose. And while the Tories were sleeping, Speaker, our government has taken action to protect Ontario businesses, particularly with reference to President Trump's steel tariffs. Speaker, it's no secret that the political landscape is chaotic and seems to be random acts of policy every day. This tide of protectionism poses a serious threat to Ontario's workers and businesses, but we are not standing idly by in this potential face of discrimination. Speaker, our government is committed to sending a strong message that discrimination against Ontario workers will not be tolerated, a call that has been joined by the European Union and dozens of nations across the world. My question is this. Will the minister please inform this House about what steps Ontario is taking to protect Ontario business? Minister. <laughs> President of the Treasury Board. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Speaker, House, we're standing up for our workers and businesses. That's why our government is tabled. We've tabled and we're committed to passing the Fairness and Procurement Act legislation that fights for the fair treatment of Ontario workers and businesses. Sadly, Speaker, instead of standing up for Ontario businesses and Ontario workers, the PCs are sitting this one out and are choosing instead to stall the passage of Bill 194 through procedural delays and tactics in the House, largely we can only assume, Speaker, as a result of their own internal struggles. On this side of the House, Speaker, our government has a plan to create fairness and opportunity for Ontarians, and it's why our the Premier has taken a pro productive, proactive and personal approach, meeting with nearly 40 U.S. governors in an attempt to influence change. Speaker, we will not take lessons yes, from that side of the House. Instead, we will continue to stand up for Ontario workers and businesses and Thank speak you. when it matters. Hey. Your question, the member from Perth Wellington. Uh, Thank you, Speaker. 
Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agricultural, Food and Rural Affairs. It appears the government will soon be announcing the shutdown of Ajax Casino. This reckless decision will likely spell the end of quarter horse racing in this province yep. and put over 1,700 local jobs at risk. The mayor of Ajax, Steve Parrish, said, we have been fighting to protect the Ajax Casino and quarter horse racing. But MPP Joe Dixon has given up by writing a two-page letter. I've uh, mentioned to members in this house once before, well, actually several times, take care of yourself, take care of your critics' role, but leave other members out of this when it comes to doing work within their own writing. Carry on. On this side of the House, Speaker, we are not giving up either. Order. To the minister, will you stand up for the people of Ajax and rural jobs, or would you rather be remembered as the minister that killed quarter horse racing in Ontario? Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I do appreciate the question from my colleague uh, from Perth, Wellington. Uh, we, of course, over the last number of years in successful budgets, have put uh, a substantial funding to sustain uh, horse racing in the province of Ontario. Ontario the ho is the home, of course, of 15 tracks, uh, two thoroughbred tracks, one quarter horse track, and 12 standard bred tracks across the province of Ontario. And we'll continue uh, to work with the local member, continue to do work with the people of Peacock Downs uh, to make sure that quarter horse racing has a bright future in the province of Ontario. Supplementary. Again, to the uh, Minister of Agriculture, this government's record on horse racing and the rural economy has been a total disaster. Yeah. Let's not forget, these are the same Liberals who secretly plotted to go to zero dollars for horse racing. It's the same Liberals who ripped apart the slots at racetracks program, knowing it could mean 23,000 job losses and 27,000 dead horses. And now it's the same Liberals who look, who look Finish, please. And now it's those same Liberal Speaker who look ready to destroy quarter horse racing for crass political reasons. Yep. Speaker, I support Ajax Council's demand. Stop the clock, please. Minister of Economic Development and Growth is warned. The member may finish. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I support Ajax Council's demand that, that the government Question, delay sir. any further decision until after the June election. To the minister, will you do the right thing and apologize to the town of Ajax and horse people across the province? Mr. Speaker, I want to um, I want to thank uh, the member for supplementary. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to provide a little history here. One job, Sno one John Snowblood, who had a very distinguished career on that side of the house, when he was part of the panel, along with Albert Buchanan and John Wilkinson. Mr. Stolo was the guy that said the SARPA racetrack program was not transparent and accountable, that changes need to be given. Whoa. A very astute observation from someone who sat on that side in that caucus for a long period of time. But you know, when you really want to look at the architect of the problems that Ajax Down is having, what needs to look at what Rod Phillips? who is a bit of an architect of what for? happened with regards to this. And secondly, the member from yeah. Ajax Pickering is a tireless defender Here. of horse racing at Ajax Downs. Yeah. Yeah. Be seated, please. New question, the member from Welland. To the Premier. Uh, Speaker, the Ontario Workers' Compensation System, or WSIB, has failed workers uh, in this province who find themselves injured at work. Under the Liberals' failed policies, if you get hurt at work on the job and you rely on compensation benefits under WSIB to make ends meet, they rely on a policy called deeming. WSIB pretends that you have a job that you don't actually have in order to allow WSIB to gut your benefits. For a government that seems to be so in tune with vulnerable workers and with fairness, this policy is detrimental to the injured workers and it sinks them deeper and deeper into poverty. When will the Liberal government put an end to deeming 
fix these failed WSIB policies and make sure that injured workers get the digni dignity and the respect that they deserve. Thank you, Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the, uh, the Honourable Member for the question, Speaker. Speaker, workers and the families in the province of Ontario need to know that when they go to work, everything is done to prevent an injury from taking place in the first place, Speaker. Ontario is one of the safest jurisdictions in the entire world in which you can work. The number of incidents has come down over the past uh, 13, 14 years, Speaker, by half. We've cut those incidents in half. Yet, these injuries continue to happen, Speaker, and unfortunately, fatalities continue to happen. We need to do everything we possibly can, Speaker, to ensure that those injuries don't happen in the first place. But to get to the member's question, Speaker, when the injuries do happen, we need to make sure that these people are treated fairly, they're treated with respect, with respect they're treated with dignity, Speaker, and, it, and it's an ongoing process, Speaker. Answer. We continue to work with the S, uh, WSIB to make sure that Ontario workers get treated the way they should, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, these injured workers and many progressive advocacy groups for injured workers have raised alarm bells for years. New Democrats brought forward multiple amendments under Bill 148. Every key amendment, including the issue of deeming, was voted down by Liberal members. We could have fixed it there. Every day I hear from workers who are deemed to have phantom jobs they don't have and have their compensation benefits cut, and they no longer can make ends meet. Workers who, for example, are di diagnosed with permanent back injuries are deemed to be able to get a job at Walmart as a greeter, which they're never going to be able to get. I've heard from workers who have gone into severe depression, have had to sell their homes and live in shoddy basements because of deeming. I ask this government again, when is the Premier going to fix our broken system of compensation, Question. make sure that injured workers get the benefits and the protections they need? When are they going to fix deeming? Speaker, thank you again for the supplementary. Speaker, as I said, it's important that when somebody is injured on the job in the province of Ontario, that they get the right treatment. Speaker, we continue to improve in that regard. Speaker, because we know it's critical. It's critical. Speaker, when somebody suffers an injury, Speaker, that they're treated properly. Now, I'm proud of the government. We passed legislation that's going to further protect injured workers. Speaker, so starting January of this year. All injured workers, including both partially and fully disabled, will finally receive the same CPI coverage they deserve. Psychological injuries are also covered now, Speaker, including work-related chronic mental stress. But, Speaker, what didn't come out in the question, Speaker, is those two initiatives that are going to help a lot of people in this province are both initiatives that both opposition parties voted against, Speaker. Oh, so when you stand up and tell me I should be doing something, Speaker, we continue eight. to look at improvements that could be made, wow. but now and then you should look in the mirror, Thank Speaker. You. Absolutely. Good question. The uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Research, Innovation, Science. According to the 2017 Global Entrepreneurship Index, Canada is ranked third out of the 137 countries in its health entrepreneurial ecosystems. It's a remarkable step for our people, specifically Ontario's youth, and many live and work, study in my riding opportunity, Spadina. Our future prosperity depends on our youth having the right skills, experience, and supports to actively participate in our e economy of today and tomorrow. Speaker, no jurisdiction can thrive in today's knowledge-based economy without invest investments in innovation that attracts ambitious entrepreneurs. Minister, could you please inform the member of this House how these investments have contributed to Ontario's economy? Thank you, Minister of Research, Innovation and Science. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Trinity Spadina for that question. Mr. Speaker, since 2014, our government has provided nearly $39 million in funding to support on-campus entrepreneurship programs in our universities and colleges, and this includes campus-linked accelerators, on-campus entrepreneurship activities. These programs, Mr. Speaker, have catalyzed the development of innovation ecosystem and they made significant contributions to Ontario's economic prosperity. Over the last three years, our government's investments in CLAs and the OCEAs has fostered over 4,000 businesses, created 6,700 jobs, generated $133 million in revenue, 
and raised $171 million in investments. The impact of this economic success can be felt across Canada and Answer. the world, with Ontario's flag flying in markets around the globe. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for his answer. It's always uh, pleasing to see our government come closer to achieve, achieving long-term economic goals such as a higher quality job growth and sustainability. Thanks to the government's investment, all of Ontario's post-secondary institutions have on-campus entrepreneurship programs. I would li also like to congratulate the minister on receiving the Innovation Ecosystem Impact Award at the recent UBI Global Awards. Okay. I and I understand that this award recognizes individuals who have made exceptional, exceptional contribution to national and international innovation ecosystem. Minister, could you please inform the member of this house how your ministry has strengthened the entrepreneurial ecosystem yes, in Ontario? Thank you. Uh, Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, this award is not for me alone. <coughs> it's a minister's job to be a catalyst to help people get the support they need to succeed. Here, here. We have built a vibrant innovation ecosystem in this province thanks to the Premier's leadership. An ecosystem with an impressive 59 accelerators and incubators at 44 colleges and universities across the province of Ontario. From 2014 to 2016, over 280,000 youth have benefited from accelerators and incubators in our universities and the colleges. According to UBI's 2017-18 Global World Ranking, uh, Incubation Ranking, four of, the, four of Ontario incubators are ranked among the top university-linked accelerators around the world. Answer. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to nurturing our innovators and to building a stronger innovation ecosystem and innovation economy in our province. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. The minister would know that the forest industry employs over 172,000 hardworking men and women and has an economic impact of $15.5 billion. Over 7,000 of those people work in my riding of Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke. The regulatory impediments that her government imposes upon them continues to have a massively detrimental effect on their ability to support their families and build our communities. The Liberals' ill-conceived Endangered Species Act is the single biggest threat to the forestry industry. On the even of election, they now propose a further two-year exemption, liberal politicking at best. Speaker, my question to the minister is this. The County of Renfrew has asked for a more meaningful five-year exemption. I support them unequivocally. Will you? Question. Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. President, thank you for the question. Actually, I have the opportunity to meet with the, the forest industry on several times on this, and I th actually, I think they are quite happy with the two-year uh, exemption. It allows them to come to a real solution to reconcile forest development and the Endangered Species Act. The Endangered Species Act is a commitment that all uh, should have to protect biodiversity in Ontario. Here, it is here. an important aspect of our policy, and everyone should be uh, behind it. There are some solutions concretely that can be achieved, and the panel that uh, we have put in place that will, that will be announced shortly is about finding practical solutions to reconcile forest development with endangered species. As I say, we're happy to continue to work on this file. I think a solution is, is appropriate and will be found. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister. New minister, same old song. Speaker, species at risk in the forests themselves should be protected using the best science available. And economic, social and economic impact should be considered equally as well. The Crown Forest Sustainability Act, the gold standard, Speaker, is the overriding guidance that should be applied. When multiple exemptions to the ESA are, ESA are required, one thing is crystal clear, Minister. Your government got this wrong from the very beginning. Yeah. It is time for the ESA to be examined by an independent panel to determine a long-term approach to protecting species at risk and their habitat without decimating this industry. Will the minister extend the exemption to five years and use that time to get working on a plan that protects species at risk, including the hundreds of thousands of humans Question. that depend on this essential industry. Thank you. 
Minister. Certainly, I think we are committed to ensuring that there's reconciliation uh, efforts between the Forest Industry and the Endangered Species Act. That's what we're working on, and that's the point of the two-year survey. Indeed, I think I am surprised that, that we're not talking about this as a big success in, because the forest industry is doing well, is prepared to do more for the environment, has done so, and will continue to do so in the future. I continue to think that the Endangered Species Act of Ontario is a gold standard. It does have within it lots of flexibility, lots of tools to both protect endangered species and recognize the socioeconomic impact. Humans are certainly part of the way in which we look at the endangered species. They are, they need endangered species protection so they can continue to rely on biodiversity in our Thank you. Stop. You see it, please? You see it, please? Start the clock. New question. The member from London West. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, more than 3,000 York University workers are on the picket line this morning, taking a stand against insecure, unstable academic jobs and the underfunding of post-secondary education that is undermining any possibility of job security. Speaker, these workers deliver 60 per cent of the instruction for York University students, but their contributions are completely undervalued. These these workers want to get back to the important work they do supporting students. York University students want to be able to learn without having to cross a picket line. Will the Premier use her influence to get the employer back to the bargaining table today so that a negotiated settlement can be reached? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. And I know surely she is not. She is not asking us to intervene in an, in, in an inappropriate way in this matter, yeah. Speaker. Ontario, Ontario's got an excellent record of. Yeah. Finish, please. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario's got a great record of dispute resolution. Over 98% of all agreements in the province of Ontario are reached on without scale. any strike or reached without any lockout, and that's because of the, the encouragement and the assistance that uh, both sides bring to the table in order to reach that agreement. But the Minister of Labour, Speaker, has some of the best mediators, the best arbitrators yes, in the country, and they've been working with these groups, Speaker. I would urge both sides to return to the table, put the students first. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, this situation is not unique to York University. 800 workers at Carleton University have also begun job action this morning. For almost a decade, Ontario has ranked the lowest of all provinces in Canada in university per student funding. Not only has this downloaded the cost of university onto students and their families, creating record levels of student debt, but it has also led to an explosion of contract staff and faculty as a way to reduce payroll costs. Speaker, students understand the negative impact this has on the quality of post-secondary education, which is why the CFS was at Queen's Park last week urging an increase in full-time permanent positions and fairness for contract workers. Will the Premier show some leadership, address the underfunding of post-secondary education, and reduce Question. precarious work in the university sector? No. Minister. Speaker, Ontario's got one of the best post-secondary systems in the entire world, Speaker. We work very, very hard. We Finish, please. Okay. Speakers, uh, speaker, we've made changes to OSAP to make sure that that system is available to people that simply couldn't avail themselves of that system in the past, Speaker. It's been a huge success. 
the primary concern of this government is the students that are attending post-secondary exactly. education in the province of Ontario, Speaker. At the same time, we respect the collective bargaining process that allows parties to bring their best to the they table. They to what we should be scale. doing in this House, Speaker, urging both sides in both situations, get back to That's the right. table, protect your interests, but put students in the province of Ontario first, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. New question, the member from Scarborough, Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Speaker, the Premier has been touring many campuses across the province to speak to students about what the government is doing to support them on and off campuses. In fact, the Minister and the Premier recently toured Scar University of Toronto Scarborough campus and heard from many of my constituents like Sheila, Devon, and others about their issues. So I know the Minister and the Premier heard first hand from many of the students at town halls and round table about supports that they currently receive like free tuition, free ear textbooks, mental health support, as well as resources they need to succeed. Speaker, through you to the minister, can she please inform the House what the government is doing to support students in our colleges and universities? Thank you, Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member from Scarborough Aging Court for that question. And yes, uh, the Premier and I had an opportunity to visit uh, many campuses and, and across the province. Premier, you actually did many more. Um, it was so incredible to hear from the students, and I know you were really listening to them. Right. Speaker, when it comes to our post-secondary education system in Ontario, we are global leaders. Sure. Just one example is that Ryerson's DMZ has been recognized as the number one business innovation hub in the world. Wow. Speaker. Our Amazing. government firmly believes that attending college and, or university should be based on a student's potential to learn, not on their ability to pay. Improving access to post-secondary education is a key priority for our government. And Speaker, I'm pleased to provide this House with an update on OSAP. Last year, we predicted that 210,000 students would receive free tuition for this academic year. This wow. year, more than 225,000 students are receiving free wow. average Supplementary. Speaker, and thank you to the minister. I'm glad to hear that our government is putting students first and breaking down one of the most significant barriers to pursue post-secondary education. We know that about 33% more mature students are now receiving OSAP than before. And I know this is not the only challenge that students are facing, Mr. Speaker. At my recent skating party at Family Day, I heard from a group of U of T uh, Scarborough campus students like Ashma, Abuti, Jessica, James, Marina, Pillar, and Georgina. I know they're watching. They'll share with me about the challenges they're currently facing, like mental health support, resources to support campus sexual violence, and limited resources for Indigenous students. Speaker, through you to the minister, can she please address the concerns identified by the students, but what are we doing about to make campus more safe and more support and being Question. inclusive to our students? Thank you. Good one. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, as the Premier and I were, were touring these campuses, uh, we were listening to students uh, and, and the concerns that they were raising. So, you know, helping students with their costs is part of Ontario's plan to keep post-secondary education within the reach of all families while building the best educated workforce in the world. And while we're revolutionizing the way students access post-secondary education in our province, the PCs voted against OSAP reform. Oh, Think wow. of that, Speaker. Oh. We are so happy that more and more people are now able to access post-secondary education, but also that means that our campuses need to be able to support people with different experiences and needs. So beginning this school year, we're investing an additional $6 million annually over three years to improve mental health yes, post-secondary services on campuses, Excellent. bringing our annual investment to $15 million. And Mr. Speaker, this is Thank just you. the beginning. New question. The member for Lampton, Kent, Middlesex. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question uh, today is to the Premier. I'm sure the Premier and her new Minister of Health have been paying attention in this House when we have, on numerous occasions, asked questions and made statements regarding water, which has become undrinkable because pile driving for wind turbine foundations has disturbed the local aquifer in North Kent. Mr. Speaker, when will this government direct the Ministry of Health? to undertake a health hazard investigation 
into the dangers posed by the heavy metals in the drinking water of my constituents. Yes. Yeah. For the environment and climate change. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for uh, what is uh, a very important issue around the, the protection of our drinking water uh, right across Ontario. Speaker, the ministry is actively holding the company accountable for addressing complaints re related to changes in their well water quality. We have undertaken a review of water quality data to ensure residents that their water is safe to drink. Thus far, Speaker, thus far, Speaker, the analysis has not shown a connection between water quality and construction activity. Speaker, the company has informed the ministry that they will work with homeowners where they are supplying alternative water supplies to provide and pay for a licensed well contractor to inspect their wells and answer any questions they may have. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the Premier. Several generations of residents of North Kent have drawn their drinking water from the aquifer, which carries water along the Kettle Point Black Shale stratification. Since the construction in this area of industrial wind turbines, whose foundations are anchored by pile driving steel beams into the shale, 17 water wells have begun producing nothing but murky brown liquid. More turbines continue to be built in North Kent, and another project, Otter Creek, is planned for the Wallaceburg area, which will involve pile driving into that same black shale bedrock. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier advocate good health policy by pushing for a stop to these unnecessary That's wind right. turbines? How many Order more out. wells must be contaminated before this Liberal government good declares question. a health hazard? Well, you, uh, thank you, uh, Speaker, and I, I appreciate the follow-up question because, uh, Speaker, it allows us to clarify uh, once again how important it is to this province that uh, uh, the water quality, drinking water, is protected uh, not only in uh, North Kent but right across the province, Speaker. I can say that uh, with, with, uh, when talking about the North Kent uh, wind farm, Speaker, last week my ministry had a very productive meeting with the scientists from Water Wells First, where the ministry presented our robust and extensive scientific results. And I would encourage the member opposite to review those results with the scientists from <coughs> Water Wells First, Speaker. I will say that, again, Speaker, that the ministry takes concerns regra regarding groundwater quality Answer. very seriously. And we're actively holding that company responsible, accountable for addressing these Thank complaints you. related to any change. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Perth Wellington has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs concerning horse racing at Ajax Downs. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. We have a deferred vote on government notice of motion number 62 relating to Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The member from Nickelbelk on a point of order. Point of order, Speaker. I believe we have unanimous consent to wear our low epilepsy awareness pins. The member from Nickelbelt is seeking unanimous consent to wear the pins for epilepsy. Do we agree? Agreed. Agreed. The member from Toronto Danforth on a point of order. I wish to correct my record in my speech on February 28th, Hansard, page 7418. I said that the NDP hadn't supported cap and trade. I had meant to say we have not supported the carbon tax. <laughs> All members are allowed to correct their record. I thank the member for his point of order. The member from Durham on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I would like to introduce constituents of mine, Diane McKenzie and Chelsea Kristen from Epilepsy Durham Region. Thank you. Member of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, wish uh, Chris Ballard a happy birthday. <laughs> Deputy, Deputy Clerk, please. 
We have a deferred vote on the no government notice of motion number 62 relating to uh, allocation of time on Bill 194, an act respecting fairness and procurement. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
All members, please take your seats. On March 1, 2018, Mr. Ballard moved government notice of motion number 62 relating to allocation of time of Bill 194, an act respecting fairness in procurement. All those in favour, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nackey. Mr. Nackey. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Susan. Mr. Susan. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Dakar. Mr. Dakar. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Verniel. Mr. Verniel. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Madame DeRosier. Madame DeRosier. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. All those opposed, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Ostra. Mr. Ostra. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Co. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 45, the nays are 33. The ayes being 45 and the nays being 33, I declare the motion carried. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London has given notice of his dissatisfaction with an answer to his question given by the Attorney General concerning PET and CT scanners in Windsor, Essex. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. The Minister of Advanced Education. Yes, Speaker, I, I could not let this uh, morning pass without uh, asking us to congratulate uh, the amazing students and graduates of Sheridan College whose uh, work was recognized last night at the Academy Awards with The Shape of Water. Four hey! wins, nine nominations, another example of excellence in Ontario's post-secondary education system, Speaker. There being no further deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.